April 2nd, 1982, Argentine forces reclaim the long-disputed Falkland Islands. Margaret Thatcher strikes back, and war erupts in the South Atlantic. The Royal Navy is thought unbeatable, but Argentina presents a weapon that surprises the world. Three hundred miles south of Buenos Aires, Argentina's elite Navy attack squadron prepares for a mission that will take them over the cold, dark waters of the South Atlantic. Comprised of only nine officers, attack squadron two is small by any standard. But equipped with their Dassault Super Etendard attack aircraft and its lethal amenity, the feared Exocet missile, these men represent a formidable adversary to even the most advanced navies of the world. This plane, designated 02 and its partner 03, hold a special distinction for the Argentine Navy. They are the same two planes that surprised the world during the Falklands War over a decade before. When these very planes took to the air in May of 1982, the Falklands conflict was considered a temporary brush fire that would be quickly extinguished by the powerful Royal Navy. But as events unfolded, the underestimated Argentine Navy would wreak havoc on British shipping, and the word exocet would become an all too familiar term in homes throughout the United Kingdom. In 1982, a territorial dispute that had been brewing for almost two centuries suddenly erupted into war. On April 2nd, Argentine dictator General Leopoldo Galtieri initiates Operation Rosario, the invasion of the Falkland Islands. Vastly outnumbered by Argentine forces, the small contingent of Royal Marines is forced to surrender, and Port Stanley falls that evening. Attempting to muster a diplomatic solution, the U.S. Secretary of State, Al Haig, goes to London. But as talks with Buenos Aires break down, a determined Margaret Thatcher dispatches the brunt of the Royal Navy to the distant waters of the South Atlantic. The decision to retake the Falklands was given the official heading Operation Corporate. In 1982, the Royal Navy had only two carriers remaining in the fleet. These were the old carrier HMS Hermes, and the new but smaller HMS Invincible. For England, the war in the Falklands was a logistical nightmare. Although the British did use Ascension Island as a stepping stone for supply and communication, the 8,000-mile journey southward stretched naval support lines to their absolute limits. It was clear from the outset that the conflict in the Falklands was to be a purely naval engagement on the part of the British. Air power was crucial to the operation, but with no airfields in the far South Atlantic, the British carrier force was to be the only real player in the impending air war. The Harrier and its updated model, the Sea Harrier, represented the bulk of the air power for the Royal Navy. The Harrier had long since developed a reputation as a lethal attack plane. It was designed for the purpose of low-level ground suppression, and with its vertical takeoff and landing ability, it can operate from just about anywhere. However, despite its versatility, the Harrier was never really designed to be a dogfighter. En route to a distant conflict in which fighters of the Royal Air Force could not participate, Harrier pilots knew that they would soon be engaging in the unfamiliar tactics of aerial combat. On the 1st of May, British ships near Port Stanley come under attack by A-4 Skyhawks and Mirage Daggers of the Argentine Air Force. Using conventional bombs, the low-flying Argentine planes damage two British warships, the HMS Alacrity and the HMS Glamorgan. The 
baby responds quickly as Harrier jump jets are vaulted into an unfamiliar role, downing enemy aircraft. The most powerful fighter deployed from Argentine bases was the French-built Mirage III. On the afternoon of May 1st, Argentine Mirages and British Sea Harriers come head-to-head -head in the first aerial combat of the war. In order to win a dogfight, a pilot needs to engage the enemy within the parameters of speed and altitude that best exploit the advantages of his own plane. The Sea Harrier is most effective against the Mirage in a medium-altitude, close-combat dogfight. Aware of this, Argentine pilots attempt to lure the Sea Harriers into the high-altitude, high-speed engagement advantageous to the Mirage. But British pilots hold their altitude, and for several hours, both sides avoid confrontation. Then, late in the afternoon, the Argentine Air Force launches a large-scale attack against the British task force. After another brief period of shadow boxing, a pair of mirages plunge downward to take on the British Sea Harriers. Lieutenant Paul Barton manages to get behind one of the mirages. Unleashing his sidewinder, Barton scores the first aerial combat victory of the war. The Harrier was also used to effect in ground attack missions against entrenched Argentine troops and the airfield at Port Stanley. Attacks needed to be accurate and well-planned in order to avoid hitting civilians in the island capital of Stanley. Low-level surgical attacks isolate targets, but it also makes the Harriers vulnerable to conventional anti-aircraft artillery. Over the course of the conflict, five Harriers are downed by Argentine gunners. Despite the protection of the Harriers, low-level attacks on British shipping was beginning to take a toll on both sides. However, the most stunning blow to the British task force would come not from low-flying bombers, but rather from an enemy they would never see. On May 4th, the British destroyer HMS Sheffield was on radar picket duty 25 miles west of the main task force. Responsible for the protection of the aircraft carrier Hermes, the men aboard the Sheffield had no idea what was about to hit them. Within the forbidding wind-blown landscape of the Tierra del Fuego lies the Rio Grande air base of the Argentine Armada. On the morning of May 4th, two Super Etendards take off on their historic mission. Approaching from the south, the two planes sneak below British radar. 30 miles from the target, the two planes burst upward and fire the missile. The men aboard the Sheffield see something on the horizon hurtling towards them, but it is already too late. The Exocet missile rips into the hull and the ship bursts into flames. Twenty British sailors are killed. The gutted Sheffield sinks during a salvage effort six days later. During the weeks to follow, British forces depend heavily on helicopters for the movement of troops and supplies. Although the loss of the Sheffield had been a blow to the Royal Navy, the Argentines were well aware that they need to destroy the British helicopter and aircraft carriers in order to win the war. On the 25th of May, Two aircraft departed Rio Grande on a mission to destroy the large British carrier Hermes. With only three Exocets remaining in their arsenal, a successful attack is crucial. Captain Roberto Kirolovic flew on this mission. You were training for, for many years for doing that. I mean, the, the country paid for you, for, for your training, for your aircraft, for your missile and everything, and the day that you have to use, Really, the problem for us was not make a mistake with that.
to surprise the British task force, the Argentines attack from an unexpected northerly direction. To make the long trip north of the task force, the pilots refuel from Argentine Air Force KC-130 tankers. After almost two hours in the air, Captain Kurolovic and his wingman split up in preparation for the final assault. Maintaining complete radio silence, Captain Kurolovic closed to within 35 miles of the task force before releasing his lethal cargo. The ruthless Exocet missile is again coldly affected. The Atlantic conveyor sinks and 12 British sailors are killed. Captain Kurolovic recalls the attack with mixed emotions. After shooting the Exocet, what I thought it was, a, what a great weapon that we got. And after that, you think that they will impact the, uh, the ship, but you always think in the, uh, on the ship, not on the people. Uh, I mean, you're looking for, for destroy the, the ship. The missile is designed for that, for neutralize or destroy or sunk a ship, not for killing the people but it's not a, the main idea. With only four aircraft and five missiles, Attack Squadron 2 dealt a tremendous blow to the powerful Royal Navy. Today, the second Attack Squadron of the Argentine Navy still operates from land bases in southern Argentina. The same aircraft that flew against the British in 1982 are today flown by a new generation of naval aviator. Lieutenant Hernan Machado is one of the elite Argentine naval pilots assigned to fly the Super Etendard. Okay, here we are with the Super E aircraft. This plane and the other one, they belong to the second squadron of attack of the Argentine Navy. We bought this plane back in 1981 in France and since then they are here with us. This is a carrot bay plane. It is a single engine, single seat. The engine is a Snegma Atar AK-50 with about 9,000 pounds of thrust. As every carrier base plane has a, a typical things like you can fold the wings to make more room in the carrier. And as you know, our aircraft carrier is really small. 25 de Mayo is um, what they call the pocket carrier, a really small, uh, like uh, the Lexington you have. Uh, you can, for instance, pull the winds. This way you can make more room in the carrier. Although the Dassault Super Etendard gained its notoriety in the Falkland Islands War, it had not been initially designed for the purpose of flying against British shipping. This is the French aircraft carrier Clemenceau. Of all industrialized Western nations, France is clearly the most independent, especially in the areas of foreign policy and defense. Outside the United States, France is the only country to have a large conventional aircraft carrier. Consistent with this independent defense policy, the French are even embarking on the ambitious construction of a new nuclear-powered carrier. The carrier-borne Dassault Super Etendard is the ultimate manifestation of French autonomy. With only the ocean as the limit, the Super Etendard can be deployed throughout the seas of the world representing the strong arm of French foreign policy. Built completely in France, the Super Etendard represents the continuation of a proud line of aircraft built by the Dassault Company. Although Dassault is now recognized as one of the world leaders in aircraft production, its lineage traces back to a humble beginning. In 1918, a young Frenchman named Marcel Bloch built his first airplane. But after getting married, 
Block resigned to the less arduous career of building furniture. However, in the 30s, Block's passion for planes reawakened, and he soon began building aircraft like this MB-210 seaplane and the Block 152 fighter. But with war looming, the French put their faith in concrete, not airplanes. The mighty Maginot Line symbolized French foreign policy in the years following World War I. Hiding behind a wall of concrete fortresses connected by an underground chain of tunnels and railways, the French simply shut out their hostile eastern neighbor. Hitler's answer to the Maginot Line was simple. He would go around it. Belgium was the weak point exploited in this strategy. German bombers screamed down on Belgian cities, bombing both military and civilian targets. The Blitzkrieg style of attack depended on fleeing Belgian civilians as part of the military strategy. French and British soldiers sent to head off the advancing German army were greeted by a flood of civilians clogging the roadways. Over France, German bombers concentrated on airfields and hangars. The majority of the French Air Force never made it off the ground. Defeat came swiftly as German troops marched triumphantly down the Champs-Élysées. A jubilant Hitler called for the establishment of the Vichy government, which would direct German policy from Paris. In a formal ceremony to mark German victory, Hitler demanded that the French officially surrender in the same boxcar that ended the war over two decades before. During German occupation, Marcel Bloch was arrested and sent to a concentration camp. But as the war heated up, so did French resistance. Marcel Bloch's brother Paul had evaded arrest and became a prominent figure in the French underground. His resistance code name was Char Dessau, French for tank. As Allied troops entered Paris, France was again liberated from the clutches of their eastern neighbor. Although jubilant crowds warmly greeted the Allied soldiers, the events of World War II had cultivated an independent fervor that would henceforth dominate French policy. At war's end, Marcel Bloch took on the resistance code name of his brother. He was now Marcel Dassault. With his aircraft company in ruins, Dassault needed to rebuild from the ground up. In other countries, jet technology was already taking hold. In Germany, the ME-262 had made a devastating impression in the air war over Europe. In England, Frank Whittle was developing his Gloucester Whittle E-2839, which would lead in turn to England's first jet fighter to enter service, the Gloucester Meteor. In America, Whittle's jet engine was modified to power an American jet fighter design, the Bell XP-59A. The French met with little success in the early days of jet aircraft. Desperate for a fighter, the French Air Force had to make do with British vampires. The thought of using a British airplane for the defense of France was not cherished by the French leadership. But with no jets of their own, they had little choice. Marcel Dassault was determined to build a jet aircraft for France. He ordered his designers, many of which were German, to build a simple yet robust plane based on the Rolls-Royce Neen engine. The Soviets had already used the Rolls-Royce engine to produce a simple yet effective fighter, the MiG-15. Dassault, figuring that if the Russians could do it, the French certainly could, began construction of France's first jet airplane, the Ouriga. Like many early jets, the Ouriguin had a front intake with the engine running down the body of the fuselage. The plane's overall design was simple and sturdy. For Dassault, the conservative approach proved successful as the Ouriguin took to the air in its historic first flight.
For Marcel Dassault, producing a jet fighter allowed him to develop strong ties with the French leadership. Ties that were previously monopolized only by the nationally controlled aircraft industries. With a strong foothold in the French aircraft establishment, Dassault wasted no time moving into the supersonic realm. His industrial concept was to cut development time by using as much as possible of what already was available. Building on the Oregon, he began working on the supersonic Mystere. The Mystere resembled the Oregon in airframe, but with its swept wings and a larger engine, the Mystere took France beyond the speed of sound. Mystere were France's first export success. India ordered the Oregon, while the fledgling state of Israel ordered both the Oregon and the Mystere, marking the beginning of what would become one of the world's strongest air forces. Into the 50s, Dassault continued putting up lighter versions of the Mystere in an effort to keep pace with the ever-expanding military technology of America, Britain, and the Soviets. The importance of maintaining a strong military, independent of NATO, reached a new level as U.S. relations with France became strained over the issue of colonial rule in Indochina. But it was not NATO that would drive the French from Indochina. In May of 1954, French troops became trapped in a northern region of Southeast Asia known as Dien Bien Phu. After days of heavy fighting, the French army surrendered. And that July, colonial rule officially came to an end. Unlike Britain, France had not yet accepted the steady dismantling of the colonies imposed by the domination of NATO. It was the prevailing Western attitude towards these liberation movements that would eventually cause France to leave NATO's military structure altogether. Under the leadership of Charles de Gaulle, France was now on her own. Marcel Dassault would be the key player in pioneering French aviation through the heady days of the Cold War. By the late 50s, the French Air Force had identified the need for a heavier attack aircraft to replace the aging Mystères. To fulfill this need, they ordered two prototypes of the Mystère 14, which by then had been rebaptized Etendard. The Air Force decided against the Etendard. However, by now, the Navy decided that it needed an all-French plane to replace the Vampire. Thus emerged the Etendard 4M, M designating naval. The first production Etendard flew in July of 1961, proving to be an effective strike aircraft, comparable to the Royal Navy's Buccaneer or the American A-4 Skyhawk. But as primarily a mid-50s design, the Etendard was quickly becoming obsolete, even before it was a decade old. By 1970, the balance of nuclear terror had gone global. France's nuclear deterrent had become a reality under the guidance of Charles de Gaulle. Now, a nuclear-capable aircraft was needed for the French. In 1969, a naval version of the Anglo-French Jaguar was tested to fit the role of replacing the Etendard. Designated Jaguar M, this land-based aircraft proved that it had sea legs. Although the Jaguar successfully completed a round of carrier operations, the French Navy decided instead on an upgraded version of the Etendard. Extensive modification of the Etendard resulted in this, the Dassault Super Etendard. Although the Super Etendard shares the name of its predecessor, it is a 90% new aircraft. 
The fuselage was redesigned to accommodate the more powerful Atar AK-50 engine. Aerodynamic modifications allow the Super Atendar to take off at a much higher weight. However, the most important feature of the new plane was its sophisticated navigation and target recognition systems. The Super Atendard was fit to perform a variety of functions from attack to the more passive role of reconnaissance. Using the four underwing pylons to carry bombs, the Super Atendard proved also to be a formidable ground support platform. This is heads-up display footage from the cockpit of an Argentine Super Atendard engaged in ground attack exercises. As the pilot approaches his target, a vertical line can be seen rising up towards the crosshairs. When the two meet, the pilot fires. For the role of ground support, the Super Atendard is equipped with rocket launchers under the wing and two 30-millimeter cannons under the nose. The Super Atendard can also be used in the aerial combat role although it would probably stand little chance against a dedicated naval fighter like the American F-14 Tomcat. The Argentine Navy does occasionally practice dogfighting between its pilots. High in the clouds over Tierra del Fuego, one Argentine pilot gives chase to another. When the opponent becomes locked in the crosshairs, the pilot informs his squadron mate that he has shot him down. Despite its versatility, the major role of the Super Atendard is neither dogfighting nor ground support. The major role for this plane is to launch the Exocet missile. This plane is really stable, really fast, for low levels in the sea. The missile actually can be carried at this point, and with a single missile with two planes, you can have a 99% of probability to sink a ship. The Exocet missile itself is a very large machine, and attaching the missile to the plane is no easy chore. First, the 30 millimeter cannons must be removed from under the nose of the aircraft. Then the fuel tank on the starboard wing needs to be removed to allow for the addition of a hard point, especially fitted to carry the missile. In strict military terms, the Super Atendard is a weapon platform, and the Exocet missile is a weapon system. Before an Exocet mission, Avionics need to be installed behind and below the cockpit to ensure communication between plane and missile. The French company Aerospatiale named its missile after Exocetus, a genus of flying fish that skims along the surface of the water. The term missile understates the true hunting power of this destructive weapon. It is really more of a rocket-propelled kamikaze piloted by a computerized navigational system determined to find its target. If the ship moves, the missile will follow. If the missile is temporarily confused by a defensive spray of metal chaff by the ship, the navigational computer will reorient itself and continue searching for the closest target. Determined to make impact, the relentless missile will not stop until it either runs out of fuel or rips through the hull of a ship. In 1979, perhaps anticipating their invasion of the Falklands, the Argentine government ordered 14 Super Atendards and 14 Exocet missiles from France. The following year, many of these Argentine ordnance men traveled to France to learn how to apply the missile to the aircraft. 
However, by 1982, only five of the airplanes and five missiles had been delivered to Argentina. When the war in the Falklands erupted, France withdrew all technical support and stopped all further deliveries of military hardware. On their own, the inexperienced ordnance officers and technicians were forced to resolve all outstanding problems relating to the aircraft and its missile. Using one of the Super Etendards for spare parts, the second attack squadron began the war with a total of four airplanes and five missiles. Because each Exocet mission in the Falklands involved two attackers, the Argentines were limited to a total of three missions against the British task force. In these three missions, two warships were sunk, proving that in today's combat environment, an under-equipped adversary can pose a lethal threat to even the most powerful navies of the world. anti-ship missile traces its roots back to before World War II. The Germans experimented with rocket-propelled anti-shipping bombs. Vaulted away from the aircraft with a rocket boost, the bomb would separate from its container and skip across the water towards the target. Close to the target, the bomb sinks, and the depth-activated fuse triggers the explosion. In World War II, American anti-ship missiles took the form of torpedoes, which traveled under the water instead of over it. In this role, the U.S. Navy Avenger sank countless Japanese ships, including the famed battleship Yamato. However, the first to use air-launched guided rockets were, of course, the Germans. During World War II, German rocket research was far ahead of its time. BMW engines were installed in rockets small enough to fit under the wing of a plane. The first major blow dealt by one of these weapons occurred in 1943 against the Italian battleship Italia, which was sunk while attempting to join the Allied fleet. Heinkel and Dornier bombers provided the platform for continued German testing on radio-controlled rockets. Here, a rocket is seen being guided directly into the center of the target shed. The most terrifying air-launched weapon used by the Germans involved the feared V-1 rocket. Equipped with its pulse jet, German Heinkel 111 bombers simply watched as the rocket streamed toward its target. In the course of the war, over 2,000 V-1s were launched, wreaking havoc on the cities of Belgium and France. The French Exocet missile is perhaps the best modern equivalent of early German standoff missiles. Deployed from the small carrier Clemenceau, pilots of the French Navy are well trained in the elusive attack methods against enemy ships. After sneaking below the enemy radar, the pilot surges upward in order to obtain a radar lock on the target. At this point, the enemy spots the incoming plane, but it is too late. The pilot has already transferred the target information to the missile and sent it on its way. The destructive power of the Exocet has not gone unnoticed by the U.S. Navy. The U.S. supercarrier is a priceless commodity and the Navy could ill afford to have an exocet ripping into its hull. 
One method of countering this threat is the phalanx system, which simply rips the missile apart with a violent hail of bullets. The U.S. Navy has its own standoff anti-shipping missile. The Lockheed P-3 Orion is fit to carry the Harpoon missile, which can be launched from a range of over 60 miles. But in this role, it is only the Super Etendard and its Exocet missile which have gained notoriety in combat. Argentine Navy Lieutenant Hernan Machado describes a typical attack mission. You go as slow as you can, and about 100 feet from the, between 100 miles and 200 miles from the target, or really low, you get low, then you have to connect the, the PA, the automatic pilot, and then you start looking on your scope, if you can see the target, actually. When you see the target, you load the target with your radar, okay, and then you transfer all the information to the missile, okay? At one distance, the system tells you if, if it's ready to launch the missile. At that time, you switch the, the armament switch on, and then just pull the trigger. Two more seconds, two seconds later, here's the missile launching. And the missile accelerates, you break away, you never see your target you're far away from your target. And then the newspapers, the newscasters, or somebody, intelligence, is going to tell you you hit the ship or not. It's launch and forget. That's the mission today. And that is the way we did it in Malvinas. The Exocet missile weighs nearly a thousand pounds. So when it drops from the plane, the pilot must compensate for the sudden shift in weight. Then you have a rate of roll to the left that because I do the brake to the left, it helped me out to go 90 degrees angle of bank and start pulling three or four Gs, getting away from the target as soon as I can. Because normally there are uh, patrols, air patrols right there in the fleet or around the fleet looking for you. The British air combat patrol never even saw an Argentine Super H and Dart. As soon as the attackers appeared on British radar, the Argentine pilots were already steering towards home. For Super A Tendard pilots, the Falklands War was a distant conflict that they would only see on the BBC News. By the time the British landed on the islands, the war was already over for attack squadron two. All five of their Exocet missiles had been fired, sinking two ships they had done their part for the Argentine war effort. By early June, the British were making a final push towards Stanley. Retaking the Falklands was not as easy as previously expected. The forbidding South Atlantic winter and the harsh terrain of the islands complicated the British effort. In the violent struggle for the village of Goose Green alone, 15 British soldiers were killed. Jones, Captain Wood, Captain James, Lieutenant Barry, Corporal Hardman, Corporal Sullivan. Despite the setback, the British troops stepped up the ground war. Back when Argentina invaded the Falklands, they had kept many of their elite soldiers on the mainland. So at the outbreak of the ground war, the inexperienced Argentine forces stood little chance against the highly skilled British infantry and elite SAS teams. On June 15th, triumphant British soldiers marched into Stanley, and the Union Jack was again raised over the city. The local civilians welcomed the soldiers who had made the 8,000-mile journey to liberate the islands. Two and a half months after the Argentine invasion, the British were again firmly in control of the Falkland Islands. El combate de Puerto Argentino. In Argentina, the defeat in the Falklands led to a breakdown in the already precarious political footing of General Galtieri. 
A frustrated country forced Galtieri from power. And in October of 1983, free elections were granted to the people of Argentina. After an arduous 8,000-mile journey home, the task force was welcomed by jubilant crowds at Portsmouth. Margaret Thatcher had achieved both a military and political victory in the Falklands. But victory came at a price, as six warships would never return to England. With a democratically elected government now firmly in control, Argentina has long since normalized relations with the Western countries that had pitted themselves against it during the Falklands War. Despite all of the social reforms and political changes at the highest levels of government, little changes in the day-to-day -day operations of the naval aviator. Every time you fly is different. I mean, uh, every day you're different, you feel different, and sometimes you don't feel like you, you, you want to fly and you have to fly. And, but the majority of the time you really are looking forward every day to go and, and fly. It's like tell my family, you, you do your job, you enjoy it, and besides that, they pay you. That's good. I like that. The most important step in naval aviation training is the delicate art of carrier operations. With the Argentine carrier temporarily out of service, pilots of the 2nd Attack Squadron take every chance they can to train with their American counterparts. American carrier rounds the tip of Tierra del Fuego, the Argentines use the opportunity to practice a few diplomatic touch-and-goes. The carrier landing is the most difficult chore in all of aviation. As the pilot approaches the ship, his pulse rate steadily increases. Although American and Argentine pilots hail from different parts of the world, they share a common bond that transcends culture and language. They are naval aviators. We are unique because uh, we are the only person that can, can land these things on the carrier, you know? It's, 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 really, it's really tough. That makes the difference. We do the same thing that the Air Force do, plus we go to the carriers and that makes the difference. We are tail hookers, and we are the best, and Air Force knows that. The Super Etendard is nearing the end of its operational career with the French Navy. Despite its advanced weapon systems, the Etendard's impending obsolescence is a reminder of how quickly defense requirements change in an era of mounting technological advancements. After serving as a multi-role attack aircraft with an autonomous French Navy since 1979, it will always be remembered for its role in the Falkland Surprise. Coming up next, find yourself in the cockpit of a long-range anti-submarine aircraft. Then the P-51 Mustang hastens the end of German domination during World War II as our high-flying Wings Marathon continues on the Discovery Channel.